Hi, I'm Dave Baring, Technical Director here at TriStar, and welcome to another Tech Talk. Today we're going to talk about Plastics Technology 101. This is our basic plastic seminar that we give to customers, and it, it talks about a little bit of everything, uh, but gives you a general overview of what plastics is all about. Now, you know, every day, uh, in some way, shape, or form, we touch plastics or they touch us, whether it's in our car, uh, if you take the subway to work, on a transit car, uh, airplanes, appliances in your home, uh, you name it, you probably have plastics somewhere in your life every day. Uh, and plastics have come a long way. Uh, if you look back at the history, it's, it's really only a little over 100 years old. Um, but plastics have come a long, long way to the point where now we're building bridges out of plastics, we're building airplanes out of plastics. Uh, most of our medical devices are out of plastics. So it's a very important part of our life, and uh, so it's important for you to understand just what plastics are all about. Now, the first thing you need to know about plastics is what exactly are they? Uh, so as a definition, there's two types of plastics that we work with. First is thermoset plastics, and these are materials that are basically molded into a shape and once they are molded, that's it. They're set permanently. They can't be changed other than through machining or um, some other f uh, form of uh, processing. Thermoplastic materials, which we're more familiar with in our daily use, are materials that are melted and can be remelted and remelted again and again and again. This is where all of our recyclable types of plastics come into play. Plastics are also broken down into two types of uh, categories. There is an amorphous plastic uh, and there is a crystalline plastic. Now amorphous plastics are very visible in, in that they are the types of plastics that you can see through. Uh, these would be things like your drink bottles, your water bottles, um, polycarbonate, acrylics, things like that. Anything that you can see through is categorized as an amorphous material. Crystalline materials are not see-through. They tend to be stronger materials and most of our engineering and high performance uh, products are in this category of plastics. Uh, some examples of thermosets, uh, some names that you're familiar with, Bakelite, Micarta, um, your phenolic materials are all thermoset materials. Products like uh, TriStar's UltraComp, which is a thermoset polyester material. Uh, and then some of the high-end materials like Torlon, which is a polyamid imid, Vespel or Meldon, which are polyamids. These are all categorized as thermosets uh, because, again, once they're molded, they are a finished form, whether that's a stock shape or a finished part. Uh, thermoplastics are a little bit more diverse, as you can see. Um, there are many, many versions of thermoplastics, all the way from the very basics of commodity plastics, like PVCs and polyethylenes, uh, all the way up to some of the higher end, high performance materials like Peaks and Torlons and Tektron and some of the other, other materials that, uh, in some cases, can be both thermoset and thermoplastic. It depends on the type of resin system that's used. Um, now, processing of plastics is uh, very diverse, obviously. Uh, thermosets, less so, uh, because to make a thermoset material, you have to use very high pressures um, and very high temperatures as a rule. So, most of the processes that are used to make thermosets are either in the form of compression molding or transfer molding or in the form of lamination, which is another type of compression molding. Um, high pressures are normally used, although with some of the wound thermosets like micartas and things like that, um, the pressures are not extraordinary. But again, the higher end, high performance thermosets do require very high temperatures and high pressures to mold that material into a shape. Uh, thermosets generally um, are going to have some form of reinforcement. That's not always true. But as a rule, uh, for better structural integrity, they're going to have some form of reinforcement. That can be anything from uh, fibers, like polyester fibers, glass fibers, 
uh, cotton fabric is used, paper, you know, there's paper phenolics. Um, and all of these are used to help reinforce that thermoset resin to make it stronger and to give it some other physical attributes. Uh, thermoplastics are a little more diverse. You can do a lot of things with thermoplastics. You can extrude it, you can blow mold it, you can injection mold it, you can compression mold it, you can thermoform it, uh, bond it. There's all kinds of processes that you can apply to thermoplastics that you can't apply to thermosets. The other thing that we can do with thermoplastics is uh, a much more diversity in terms of additives. Um, we can put in uh, all types of fillers, again, to help reinforce those thermoplastics to make them stronger, to add to their electrical properties, to add to their uh, heat dissipation properties. Uh, there's additives that make some plastics uh, better uh, static discharge materials. Uh, and all of this is done in the form of specific additives. Um, we also have other materials or other additives that can be put in to improve the wear properties of plastics, the frictional properties. Um, so all of these things are really used to enhance the property of the base polymer. And thermoplastics give us a lot of diversity in these types of areas. Uh, some of the types of additives we use in terms of reinforcing additives would be things like glass fibers, graphite powder, uh, carbon fibers, Kevlar, um, there's also mineral fillers like MOLLE, MOS2, um, carbon black, graphite powders, um, calcium carbonate, calcium silicate, all types of minerals that are used again to enhance the physical or thermal or electrical properties of that base polymer. Um, there are also some chemical additives we put into some plastics for fire retardant. Um, lubricating media such as PTFE or silicone oils. Um, molly and graphite are also added to plastics to help with lubricity. Um, UV stabilizers can be added to plastics uh, to further enhance the UV capabilities of a plastic. So, as you can see, thermoplastics, a great deal of diversity in terms of what we can do with it. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of different compounds that we can uh, use to specifically address a particular need. This is a kind of our, our uh, nutrition triangle for plastics. And I want you to notice a couple things here. First of all, we've broken plastics down into three commodity uh, engineering and high performance plastics. Those are the three categories that we, we uh, break plastics into. And these are really driven off of temperature. As you can see, the bottom part of the triangle are our commodity plastics. And these are materials that are the lower end materials in terms of cost, but they're also lower end in terms of performance properties. Um, they are materials that typically don't work above 200 degrees Fahrenheit as far as your continuous operating temperatures. Um, these products do, though, have pretty good chemical uh, properties. So, You'll see polyethylene, polypropylenes are very common in uh, chemical applications, pump bodies, valve bodies, uh, fittings, uh, hose and pipe. A lot of these types of commodity plastics are very applicable in those environments because they do so well in chemical, uh, uh, in chemical uh, attacks. So, uh, and those do tend to be on the lower end of the price scale. You know, 50 cents a pound, a couple dollars a pound is not untypical of these types of plastics. But again, the, the primary um, point that we want to make here is these commodity plastics do tend to be at the lower end of the temperature scale and physical strength-wise, not necessarily going to be the strongest materials that, are cap that we have in, in terms of plastics. You'll also see at the bottom of the triangle there, we've also separated out amorphous versus crystalline. And again, that's just to demonstrate the differences between uh, all three of these classes of materials. All three classes have both amorphous and crystalline um, product. The next level up is engineering plastics. These are the materials that are generally going to be from the two to 300 range. Some of these materials will go a little bit higher than 300 degrees. 
but you can see here that on the crystalline side we've got things like the, the polyesters, your PET, your PBT. Uh, these are products like Erdolite and Hydex uh, 4101. Um, your polyamides, your PA material, these are the nylon family, both cast and extruded nylons. Uh, POM is uh, acetyl or your Delrin type product. Um, we've got uh, the UHMW, the polyethylene, is right at the borderline there. We, we classify it as an engineering plastic because from the standpoint of its, its physical attributes, its performance attributes, it is an engineering grade material. However, uh, it does have an operating temperature just under that 200 degrees, so it's kind of on the borderline there as to whether it's an engineering grade or a commodity grade. Um, but we do class it as engineering because of its, its uh, attributes, its physical and, and performance attributes. Um, on the crystal, on the uh, amorphous side, we've got polycarbonate, which we all know is Lexan, um, and then PPO or Norel. Um, these are materials that, uh, again, are going to be slightly in better, better in terms of physical properties. Um, the strength-wise, these are materials that are, are much tougher in terms of their physical attributes. Uh, Temperature-wise, they have higher operating temperatures. Um, for the most part, chemical resistance is really going to be a variable. Um, uh, hydroscopic tendencies, again, going to be a bit of a variable in this category. But 200 to 300 degrees, these are the materials that we typically will work with. And again, um, in, in terms of the additives and the things that we can do with these materials to enhance or improve them, um, clearly uh, this category of product is, is, falls under that type of product. The next level up is, is high performance plastics. And uh, you'll see at the very top of the triangle here, we've got uh, three materials that end with an I. PBI, which is polybenzimidazole or cellazole, is kind of the top dog in the plastics world. Um, has the highest operating temperature. Um, uh, very, very tough, tough material, but it's also the most expensive uh, material in the plastics world as well, other than a few really obscure materials. Um, PI is polyimid. Most of the world knows polyimids as Vespel or Meldon. Uh, there's also Duratron, uh, there are several other grades of material, Centimid, these are all materials that fall under the category of a polyimid. And then you've got uh, PAI, which is polyamidimid, uh, which is the Torolon type products. Um, now the reason the imids are at the very top is because they, they do fall into a category of their own. Even though they're a high performance material, imidized materials are very, very special materials, all very expensive but uh, certainly the highest operating temperatures of any plastics out there on the market. Um, below that top of the heap there is, is some of the materials that we work with at TriStar very, very predominantly. Things like peak, um, all the different types of peaks, glass fields, carbon fields, the bearing grade peaks. There's a lot of new variables with peak with new uh, um, uh, life science grades of peaks that are being used as implantables now. Um, the PTFE family, like the Rulons, uh, the fluorescent materials. Um, PTFE is a, a very big part of what we do at TriStar, uh, especially with Rulon bearings and, and fluorescent uh, components. Um, PPS. Uh, PPS is a product that we refer to often as a poor man's peak. Um, this is a product uh, that has uh, many of the same attributes as peak, uh, but for a lot less money. Uh, but you can see here it's, it's one of the materials that's in the 300 plus category, and in fact, peak, PPS, PTFE are all really in the 400 plus category. Um, so those would be on the crystalline side. On the amorphous side, we've got our cell phones. And then you've got uh, the polyether imid, which is Ultem. These again are the, the materials that are typically going to be either translucent or see-through. Uh, the cell phones and polyether imid are very, very common in the medical world and dental components. 
Um, very tough, durable materials. They do really well in steam, so for autoclaving or for gamma radiation um, exposure, these are the materials that are, are going to be most prominent um, in those types of activities. <coughs> now moving on to, uh, again, just kind of a do an overview of where some of these products fall. The commodity plastics, again, are materials that are going to be 200 degrees and below. Um, low physical properties, good chemical resistance, um, it's going to be light duty parts in terms of their structural value, um, a lot of pump bodies, valves, fittings, things like that as I mentioned before. And again, these are going to be the lower cost resins, 50 cents to 250 a pound is, is pretty common for these types of materials. Um, the commodity materials include your polyethylenes, and that's all different densities, low density, medium density, high density, very high density. Uh, all of these polyethylenes fall under the commodity plastics category. And again, the UHNW polyethylene, uh, while it is still a 200 below operating temperature, we do categorize that as an engineering polymer. Uh, polypropylene, very, very tough material, uh, good material in terms of its chemical resistance. Uh, a lot of engineering applications in this environment, especially in chemical uh, facilities, uh, petrochem applications. Um, semiconductor polypropylene is fairly common in fluid handling uh, components. Polystyrenes, um, didn't mention that before, but polystyrenes is everything from drinking cups to the models that you make with your kids. That's where the polystyrenes come in. Um, there are also uh, higher value polystyrenes uh, that are used in everything from packaging to uh, display panels and, and things like that. Uh, PVC, um, both rigid and flexible versions. A lot of PVC tubing is used because, uh, partly because of its see-through properties, but it's a very flexible material. It maintains that flexibility, doesn't lose its plasticizers very quickly. Uh, good chemical resistance, uh, but again, temperature is the key. It's always going to be below that 200 degree level. Um, and then ABS. Uh, ABS is one of the more common plastics that you see in automotive applications, especially interior components. And more and more ABS is being blended, uh, like with polycarbonate, to produce a very, very tough uh, material that can take impact, uh, vibration, uh, the types of things that you would expect to see in an automotive application. Um, the engineering grades, again, kind of recapping, 300 degrees is, is kind of where we're looking at uh, as a top end with these materials. The engineering plastics are generally more versatile, partly because we can do a lot more in terms of processing and partly because we can do a lot more in terms of the types of fillers and compounding that we can do to uh, meet very specific requirements in an application. Um, the cost for these materials will run anywhere from the you know dollar dollar fifty range all the way up to twenty five dollars a pound, uh, depending on what category and what fillers and uh, how it's got to be processed. So um, that's the engineering plastics again are probably the most common category of plastics out on the market. Um, some of the materials, the nylons, all layer nylons, type six, type six six, six eleven, six twelve. Uh, the 4-6 uh, high temperature nylon. Um, all of these are available in extruded materials, uh, molded materials, uh, cast, there are cast versions of the nylons which uh, really open up a lot of uh, uh, applications, especially outdoor or things like sprockets and gears and shivs and uh, you know bushings on everything from cranes to uh, waterworks components. Um, the nylons tend to be uh, a lower cost product as, as a general rule. Um, there are, are nylons, especially in the cast side, that there's a lot of new additives uh, that are being used. Uh, Molly, of course, has been around for a long time. Oil-filled nylons are very, very good in food applications. Um, it's an easy-to-machine product. Um, if there is a downside to your nylon products, it's uh, that they do tend to be fairly hydroscopic. So you got to be um, a little careful about where you apply it in terms of its um, 
moisture uh, potential, its moisture absorption potential. Um, and, the, and the one thing that you need to know about thermoplastics too is that most of them do have some level of hydroscopic uh, um, values and we need to be aware of that when we're in the design process again to take that into consideration whether it's a structural part or a bearing part just to be sure that we're accommodating that potential um, expansion from moisture. Um, your acetal materials, uh, there's two different grades. There are what are called homopolymers, which is what uh, Delrin is best known as. Delrin is, is, is the homopolymer version. Uh, there are a number of manufacturers of the copolymers. Um, uh, we, we happen to sell a one called Acetron, which is a quadrant material. Uh, these are available in extruded materials, compression molded sheet, extruded sheet. Uh, you can get it in film uh, for thin, thin stock. Um, there are glass additives that can be put in to help strengthen it. Uh, there's chemical lubricants as well as PTFE. Uh, if you're familiar with Delrin AF, uh, that is a uh, homopolymer acetyl with a uh, PTFE additive. Uh, and that obviously helps with wear and friction. Uh, that's what PTFE really is all about, is improving wear and friction properties of really any thermoplastics. Uh, PPO or Norel, uh, one of the less known materials, but certainly one of the more capable of materials in the engineering plastics uh, category. It's really known for its excellent electrical properties. And as an unfilled resin system, it has extraordinarily uh, good strength properties. Um, so it's something that we'll use where, you know, either fillers can't be, um, uh, can't be tolerated for some reason, like it could be in a semiconductor application or a clean room application. Um, uh, but it's a really good material in terms of, of that property as well as its dielectric properties. Um, polycarbonate is another engineering material. Again, this is one of our see-throughs, one of the amorphous materials. Uh, but polycarbonate, most of the world knows it as bulletproof glass. It's, it's the uh, Lexan trade name is, is the best known. Uh, but polycarbonate, a very, very tough material, obviously. Um, uh, very hard to break it, um, but uh, it's very commonly used in medical and dental devices now because it, uh, um, again, is a see-through product and uh, can take a lot of impact. So very, very common material uh, in the medical world as well. Uh, a few other materials in the engineering plastics, polyesters, your PET, your PBT. The advantage that the polyesters give is that they, they do have a little bit of a bump in terms of uh, properties over um, your acetals and your nylons. Um, polyester is an FDA and NSF and USDA material, so it's very, very common uh, now in the food packaging and processing world. Um, there's a bearing grade version of this, uh, the PET called Erdolite TX, which is an outstanding material in terms of wear and uh, oddly enough it's also one of the better wearing materials in terms of its abrasion resistance. Um, it's right up there close to UHMW in a lot of ways uh, in terms of abrasion resistance. So in the food world, especially in things like, uh, you wouldn't think it, but uh, like flour, a pasta, uh, pasta making equipment, uh, very very tough on plastic components. Erdolite and Erdolite TX are excellent candidates for that because they do so well in abrasives. Milk, oddly enough, is also very abrasive, both liquid form and dry form. Um, so, you know, that, that's a great place for an Erdolite product. PBT, very, very similar. Um, and in, in the case of the PBT, um, it's got a little better chemical resistance. Uh, and a little bit better impact strength. So if there's an application where we might have some chemistries thrown out there that the PETs won't stand up to, then we would go to the PBT. Um, and then UHMW, the last one in this category we'll talk about. Again, UHMW, polyethylene. UHMW stands for ultra high molecular weight. And what that basically means is that the density or the molecular structure of this particular grade of polyethylene is highly structured. It's um, 
that's why it has such great um, abrasion resistance. It's it's the most common material for like chain guides and uh, any place where you're dragging things across uh, packaging lines or um, you know drag chains at log mills. Uh, a lot of amusement park uh, operators are using uh, various types of, of UHMW for the chains on roller coasters. Um, zero moisture absorption, so you don't have to worry about that if it's an underwater application. Um, very low friction inherently. Poly polyethylenes are basically a, a long chain extension of wax. Um, so the uh, polyethylene, especially the UHMW, very, very good material if you're looking for abrasive wear or just generally in wear uh, and friction properties. A lot of new uh, combinations in the UHMW family, oil fills, ceramic fills, uh, there's new dimensionally stable versions, and then there's also a new high temperature version uh, called Tyvar Hot, um, which takes that 180 degree uh, top end capacity of UHMW and now extends it up into the mid 300s. So you get the abrasion resistance, you get the low friction properties, you get uh, a lot of the uh, great attributes of UHMW, but you also now get that enhanced temperature uh, capability. Um, now the high performance materials uh, now we're talking about the most expensive versions of plastics. These materials are typically going to be in the uh, 25 to 200 and above dollar per pound range. And we're talking now about just the resin cost. Um, but these are materials that generally are associated with temperatures much higher than even the 300 degree level that we show in our triangle. Um, most of these materials are going to be 400 plus. Uh, some of them will go up to continuous operating ranges of 600, 650, 750. In the case of uh, the Celazol PBI material, uh, 800, uh, 1100 short term in air. So these are the materials that um, are truly high performance. Their physical strength is greater than the engineering grades. The unique thing is that their physical strength is maintained uh, across the, a good portion of their temperature, operating temperature range. So um, very, very rugged materials. Most, most of these have fairly low thermal expansion rates, uh, so they're easy to design with. Uh, most of them have pretty good chemical resistance. Um, ironically, um, at the top of that triangle, remember the imidized materials, the PBI, the PI, and the PAI. Anytime you see uh, an I in the chemical uh, moniker of a plastic, that means imid. And uh, for us in the plastics world, imid translates very loosely to sponge. These materials do tend to be fairly hydroscopic in certain conditions. Uh, in fact, in the case of polyimids, um, you can put that into a 600 degree uh, dry air application, no problem whatsoever. But if you put that into a bucket of, of boiling water, bye bye. The material will go away really quick. And that's a very expensive loss. Um, so, there, you know, these are some of the little things that you, you have to be aware of. And um, that's what we do at TriStar is we make you aware of these little types of nuances about these materials. Um, again, the high performance materials, uh, excellent weight uh, to strength ratios. Um, a lot of metal parts being replaced by these types of plastics, especially in aerospace applications or applications where weight is absolutely critical. Um, and that's becoming more and more common, uh, even in automotive applications. Some of these materials are being used in places on automobiles, partly because of weight savings, because uh, you cut down weight and you cut down uh, fuel consumption. Same thing goes in the aerospace world. You look at uh, the new 787 or the Airbus uh, A380. These, these planes are predominantly plastic. Uh, now that's in the form of composites in, in many ways, but even interior components new lightweight uh, um, plastic materials that are being used. So um, strength, very low weights, um, thermal properties outstanding on these materials, chemical resistance 
pretty good in most cases. Um, temperature ranges up to and including 800 degrees on some of these materials. Uh, but again, your costs on these are high. You, these are the Cadillacs of the plastics world and the Rolls Royces and the Maseratis and whatever else you want to throw out there. But these are the materials that are going to cost you the most, but they will also give you the best performance. Now all of these materials um, are, are going to be classified as both thermoplastic and thermoset. Uh, that makes these fairly unique. Um, and it really depends on the type of application as to which one of those versions we use. Uh, Torlon, for instance, as a thermoset, is typically going to be machined into a close tolerance part. Um, if you need to injection mold huge quantities of Torlon, there is another version of Torlon that you can, in fact, injection mold. Uh, same thing for polyimid. Um, there's a compression molding grade or direct forming grade. There's also an injection molding grade. Uh, PTFE, or Teflon, is one material that you can't do that with. Uh, PTFE is a product that can only be molded and machined. Um, now it can be what's called auto molded, which is where you actually press the part into a near net part. Uh, but that's a process that doesn't really hold very tight tolerances, so the part would be something that's fairly benign in design. It's something, an ID, OD part, very simple geometry. It can be done uh, through a form of auto molding, but you cannot injection mold uh, PTFE uh, because it does not melt like a classic thermoplastic. Now there are a whole another family of fluoropolymers called melt process fluoropolymers, which would be things like FEP, uh, PFA, ETFE, ECTFE. These are all materials that could in fact be injection molded, but that's uh, totally different from PTFE, which would be like the Rulons and the Fluorescent and Ultraflon and some of the materials that uh, uh, we at TriStar use predominantly for bearing applications. Um, so PTFE is one of those little oddball ones that you uh, you learn about uh, from TriStar. Now, <clears throat> some of the, uh, the little things about these materials, uh, PTFE, as I just mentioned, um, uh, while it's limited in how it's made, it is not limited in terms of its different capabilities. Uh, between the Rulons and fluorescents and ultraflons, we have literally hundreds of different versions of blended PTFEs. And the advantage that this particular grade of material gives you is that um, you've got a very broad temperature range, minus 400 to plus 550, uh, even upwards of 600 with some of the grades. Um, it's chemically inert, uh, um, good dielectric properties, variations in thermal properties depending on the fillers, um, <coughs> very good insulator, uh, both thermally and dielectrically. Um, of course, low friction is, is inherent with PTFE. So, um, again, one of our more diverse materials um, and something that we can make any shape out of uh, in terms of uh, square, round, hexagonal, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's a very, very diverse material in terms of how we can process and produce it. Uh, peak, um, again, because of its very high strength properties inherently, uh, when you start adding things like carbon fibers, uh, you do a couple things. You, you can further strengthen it, you uh, improve its uh, thermal dissipation properties through those carbon fibers, um, you do get pretty good wear properties from that carbon. There's also a glass filled, which uh, is more of a structural material, not necessarily a good material for bearings, but a good structural material. Excellent dielectric material, uh, excellent thermal uh, insulator material. Uh, and then there are, are different grades of, of what are called bearing grade materials, uh, different variations of fillers where we use uh, graphite powder and PTFE and some carbon fibers and any number of different combinations to produce a bearing grade peak. And again, the peak uh, almost has, uh, I mean, it's very similar chemical uh, resistance as PTFE, but it's a much stronger and stiffer material than your filled PTFEs. 
Um, your cell phones, uh, this would be like polyether cell phone, polyphenylene sulfide. Um, these are materials that have uh, 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 outstanding qualities in terms of chemical resistance, uh, steam resistance. These again are your see-through materials that are used in the medical dental world um, predominantly. Um, the uh, Altem or polyether imid is a GE product. Uh, it's another one of the see-throughs. It is also very predominant in the medical uh, industry. Um, again, partly because of its autoclavability. Uh, microwave transparent. Uh, you see a lot of Altem in microwave cookware. Uh, and also has good gamma radiation resistance. So the cell phones and the polyether imid, again, very, very common uh, applications in medical and dental. Um, a PPS, I'll, I'll mention PPS because it, it is kind of in a family of its own. Um, trade name wise, people know it as either Riton or Tektron. Those are two predominant ones that we have at Tristar. The nice thing about the PPS is it's got uh, very, very similar capabilities as peak, a slightly lower temperature range, but in terms of chemical resistance, physical strength, um, uh, low hydroscopic uh, properties. Uh, it's got uh, bearing grades are available that have excellent wear uh, capabilities. Uh, but again, the nice thing about the PPS uh, is that you get all of these enhanced properties uh, that are very competitive with the peak but at a much lower cost. So if you uh, think you need peak, you might want to consider looking at the Tektron material or Riton uh, for your application. Um, now, we'll finish up here with, with the imidized materials uh, just for one more recap here. The, the Torlon product is a very, very diverse product. It's from Solve um, and Quadrant. Um, there are a couple of bearing, actually a number of different bearing grade materials where uh, PTFE is used, uh, graphite powder is used. Uh, there are glass filled materials, but the, the, the great thing about the Torlons is that from a structural uh, integrity uh, standpoint, these are very, very tough, tough materials. Um, very common in the aerospace world, very common in the automotive world, um, and a very, very good material in terms of its wear properties as well. Uh, Torlon 4301, uh, every time you go to the dentist and you hear that drill going at about 300,000 RPM, the little bearing in the end of that dental drill is running on Torlon 4301 uh, retainers. So you know it's got to be tough. Um, so Torlon, very diverse family of materials, um, 485, 500 degree operating temperatures, so one of our top end materials. Um, the polyimids, again, Vespel, Meldon, Duratron, those are Syntimid, those are some of the trade names. Um, the, the imid families uh, of materials are, um, again, uh, one of the highest cost materials, but if you need superior performance, whether it's structural or tribological performance at extreme temperatures, uh, again, we're looking at 550, 600, 650 degrees, even excursions up into the mid-700s, the polyimids are uh, an excellent call for those types of applications. And then finally, PBI, polybenzimidazole or cellazole. Um, this is the gold standard for the plastics world. It is the most expensive, but it also is the most uh, versatile in terms of temperature. Um, I personally have used the, uh, the Celazole material in some applications uh, right about 850 degrees. Uh, it's the only thing it would hold up, um, and it did an outstanding job for the short time that it was required to hold those temperatures. Um, as I said earlier, this particular material can actually take excursions, short-term excursions in air upwards of 1100 degrees. So, and that's in an unfilled condition. Um, so again, if, if you have that application and they're rare, especially if people who are looking at 1000 degrees are generally looking at ceramics or metals, 
um, but on that rare occasion that you may have a particular need to either save weight or, or may have some other reason that you need a polymer in there, um, the Celazol PBI is certainly a candidate uh, for an application like that. So that pretty much covers um, the, the plastics world as it stands today. There's a lot of new things going on. Uh, we're always looking at new alloys, we're looking at new fillers, uh, we're looking at uh, extending um, the uh, chemistries a little bit here and there to make new polymers. Um, but the bottom line is uh, asking the right questions. And at TriStar, um, one of the advantage that, advantages that we offer to our customers is that we are an engineering company first, and our goal is to help you with uh, getting the right answers to your questions. So what we would suggest to you is, is going through this simple process of asking these questions. First of all, is the application going to be structural or bearing? Um, two very distinctly different applications there. So, you know, let's try and define uh, which of those it is. What are the temperatures that the part's going to see? Um, and I, I, what it emphasizes I have in other tech talks, we need to know what the continuous operating temperature is, but we also need to know what the high end and the low end temperatures might be, especially in the case of a bearing where we need to consider press fits and running clearances. What are the physical demands on this part? Is there a lot of impact, a lot of vibration? Um, or what are the cycle rates? You know, is it uh, um, thousands of cycles per hour or is it one cycle per year? You know, wh what are the demands on the part? If it's a bearing application, um, if you've seen our bearing presentation, you know that we have six very specific questions, but we always want to know what the load is, the speed, we need to determine what the PV rating is of the material. Um, so those are some things that we, we want to try and identify. What's the environment that this uh, product is going to operate in? Um, are there chemicals involved? Is there water? Is it dry? Is it abrasive? What kind of heat? What's the generation of the heat? Um, all of these little environmental issues come into play. Um, obviously, what are the cost considerations? Um, you're not going to put a PVC into a 400 degree application as you've seen by our triangles. Each one of these materials is driven by those temperature limitations. So if you refer back to the, the triangle here, you'll see what categories you can, you can look at and your costs are going to be driven by those same temperature ranges. So um, you know, help us help you by understanding what your cost concerns are right up front. Um, part of it is in selecting the right material, but part of it also is in selecting the right the processing. Um, if you've got a large quantity and costs are a driving factor here, obviously we want to direct you into injection molding. Um, once the capital expense of a tool is out of the way, injection molded parts are always going to be less expensive than machine parts. Um, so cost considerations up front, that will help us a lot in, uh, in guiding you. And then finally, what's the service life expectation? Um, is this part really designed to have a failure designed in? I mean, uh, I have some applications where the customer is happy with uh, 100 hours of service. Uh, we have other customers that have 10,000 hour requirements or 10 years. But, you know, be a little practical about this and understand that uh, we are dealing with plastics and while I, I have applications where I've been successful for years and years and years, um, it really comes down to bottom line, what does the application require and what do you as a company desire for that part to do in terms of its longevity. Um, if you ask these simple questions, uh, with us, um, then we can certainly give you some, some more direction. A um, couple of other things just quickly here. If we are looking at a structural part, there's some things that we want to know too. Um, is the part in tension, compression, or flex? Um, all these different materials will have different ratings. Uh, some are better in flexural modulus than others. Some are better in compressive modulus than others. So these are the kinds of things we're going to ask you. Um, 
the exposure, again, environmental exposure, um, especially in the medical world, what kind of radiation or what kind of sterilization, uh, gamma radiation, uh, is it solvent uh, cleaning, um, you know, just what all kind of exposures is the part going to be seeing? Um, do the parts have close tolerance requirements? Um, this comes into play when we're looking at machine versus molded. Injection molded parts, for the most part, have a broader tolerance band than we can do with machining. So if you are looking at a part where you need to hold plus or minus one, chances are pretty good you're not going to get that in most of the injection molded parts, especially with the engineering plastics. High performance materials, you might be able to hold that in certain, in certain grades, but as a rule, it's very difficult. Um, do the quantities justify injection molding too? Uh, and uh, at, at that point, when we look at a structural part especially, is the geometry of the part conducive to injection molding? If there's heavy walls or if there are a lot of variations in walls, not generally a good injection molding part. Um, and then again, what is the life and cost expectancy of the part going to be? Uh, that's very critical in picking the right material. If the part's uh, a bearing application or a wear, again, we're looking, uh, you know, what, what are your frictional requirements? Does this part need to be extremely low friction or can you live with uh, um, higher friction? Uh, that's going to be a big driving force behind our material selection process. What's the load on that part going to be? And again, if you've looked at our PV Tech Talk, you'll understand a little bit more about bearing load and how we determine that. Uh, what is the speed? Uh, surface feet per minute is what we, we uh, look at. And uh, the other thing we want to know is what type of motion is it? Is it linear? Is it rotary? Or is it oscillating? All three of those types of motions produce different bearing requirements, uh, partly because of the thermal conditions that are generated by those types of motions. Um, what is the combined speed and load factor, or PV? Um, that's a very critical point. Um, is there impact or vibration involved? Uh, a lot of materials don't do well in impact and vibration because they, are, they tend to be a little too brittle. Um, we can do things to improve the ductility of materials by additives, um, but it's good to know this up front if the part's going to sit like underneath the train and rattle all day. Uh, it's good to know that up front. Um, also, you know, as with the structural parts, what, what do you expect in terms of life? Um, are you looking for a maintenance-free bearing that's going to last for three years, or are you looking for something that uh, just to get, through, get you through the next uh, preventive maintenance, three months, six months? Um, and then, you know, that brings up the whole idea of maintenance. Um, most of these materials, well, I'll say all of these materials are considered to be self-lubricating, the ones that are bearing grade materials. So we don't advise lubrication, um, but we want to know up front what types of maintenance you expect to do on this part. And if you do have a requirement for lubrication, then we need to kind of work with you on determining how that's going to be done and really what the downside of that might be. So. Uh, we will ask you questions about your maintenance requirements. Now, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, we touch plastics every day. Um, as you can see from some of these pictures, it's everything from uh, donut making equipment to dishwashers, um, the Pikes Peak Railway. I mean, these are some of the places that we get involved with. But uh, plastics are very, very diverse, especially today not just in terms of the polymers that are available, but all of the additives and all of the processing changes that we can do uh, to improve and enhance those materials for uh, better performance. So the TriStar Advantage obviously is that this is what we do for a living. And we invite you to contact us either through our website, www.tstar.com, or call us at 1-800-TRISTAR and we'd be more than happy to work with you on helping you determine where plastics might fit in your world. Thanks for joining us today. I hope this has been informative and we look forward to seeing you in another Tech Talk.